Welcome back to Hardware Unbox. Today I'm looking at the number one most popular monitor on Amazon. It's the Acer SB220Q. In fact, this seems like it's the most popular display at the retailer by far, as it tops both the best selling monitors list and the most wished for monitors list. So Amazon is telling us people both want this monitor and are buying this monitor in significant numbers. Another key indicator just how popular the SB220Q is comes in the form of user reviews. There are nearly 4,000 user reviews for this monitor on Amazon, giving it a 4.5 star average, which is pretty solid. We'll have to see how it holds up in our testing, but yeah, 4.5 stars is a pretty good rating from nearly 4,000 buyers. Despite all this popularity, Acer actually doesn't sell the SB220Q in Australia. I had to import one from Amazon US, and that cost me a pretty sweet fortune. The monitor itself is only 90 US dollars, and I think I paid something like 65 US dollars for shipping, so that's the value equation thrown out the window for me. In any case, one of the reasons why I think the SB220Q is so popular is down to that price tag. $90 is very cheap for a monitor. It's hard to find many cheaper than this. In fact, once you start hitting 70 or even 80 US dollars, you start limiting yourself to sub 1080p options and plenty of other outdated rubbish. So if you've just built a PC and you have nothing left in your budget, grabbing one of the cheapest 1080p displays on Amazon seems like something that a lot of people are doing. The specs also make this quite enticing for below $100. We're looking at a 22-inch 1080p IPS panel with a 75 hertz refresh rate. Now, if you've been watching plenty of our monitor reviews, this is not quite in the same realm as the usual 1080p and 1440p 144Hz stuff we look at, but I think what Acer is offering here is very impressive for the price. This is an IPS panel, not TN, and TNs are usually the cheapest monitor category. And on top of that, we do get a slight bump up in refresh rate from a baseline 60Hz to around that 75Hz. A few little extras here and there can go a long way to making an entry-level monitor stand out from the pack. That said, 22 inches, or more accurately, 21.5 inches, is quite small for a monitor. Even 24 or 25 inch displays feel like a substantial upgrade in panel size. Something 24.5 inches ends up nearly 30% larger, so I feel this is one of the more significant trade-offs to bring the price down. And that shows when you look at the monitor market. You find pretty much that you can't find a 24 inch IPS display for less than $100. With that said, the SB220Q does feature adaptive sync support, but it only comes with a single HDMI port alongside VG. So as of right now, Adaptive Sync is only usable with AMD GPUs, as Nvidia's current generation products don't support Adaptive Sync over HDMI. The Adaptive Sync implementation isn't great either. With just a 75Hz maximum refresh and 48Hz minimum, there's no low frame rate compensation available here. This means as soon as your frame rate drops below 48fps, Adaptive Sync disengages and you'll start seeing tearing or stuttering depending on your vSync settings. It's not a great experience to fluctuate in and out of the Adaptive Sync window. It can be quite jarring, so having a graphics card capable of consistent 1080p 60fps gameplay is going to be key. Not everyone buying a $90 monitor is going to fall into that category. If you have an RX 560, for example, you might struggle. On the other hand, these sorts of Adaptive Sync issues are present with almost all sub 100Hz displays, so this isn't a unique problem to the SB220Q. In terms of build quality, the SB220Q is extremely basic. Again, shouldn't be much of a surprise given the bargain basement price. The stand is almost entirely plastic. It's surprisingly solid, which is a good thing, and overall the display is very thin, but this is a cheap design and build. Unspectacular plastic, average bezel size, and very limited adjustability. The stand only supports tilt adjustment, and because of the small display, display size, with that height adjustability, it sits very low on your desk. Most people will need to raise this up a good 10 or 20 centimeters for ergonomic viewing, and you can't really do that with a VESA arm as there's no VESA mount. I don't expect budget monitors to feature a height adjustable stand, as that's an expensive addition, but to not have a VESA mount as well is a bit of a stinger and really limits this monitor's usability. There's no directional toggle here for controlling the on-screen display. We're stuck with face buttons, although again, this isn't a surprise in this price category. On a positive note, Acer hasn't skimped in the OSD. There's plenty of settings in here in line with most of their other budget monitors, so we still get stuff like blue light filters and cheat crosshairs. There's also several overdrive settings, unlike some other budget monitors that I've reviewed that completely neglect the features. That's pretty nice. Speaking of overdrive modes, let's take a look at response time performance. Three modes here. Normal 
normal being the default, and there's also off and extreme on either end. Off is very slow. We're facing a 16.24 millisecond greater gray average, which is typical of these sorts of entry-level 1080p IPS panels without overdrive. Ghosting is significant using this mode with long smear trails following moving objects. Only 27% of transitions come close to meeting the lengthy 13.33 millisecond refresh window, so this mode simply isn't fast enough and wouldn't be great at 60Hz either. Normal takes things the other way. Now we have a 6.40 millisecond greater gray average, which is decent for an IPS monitor and allows the SB220Q to achieve 100% refresh rate compliance. However, this has come at the expense of overshoot and quite a significant amount of overshoot. An average error rate of 14.6% is high and around half of all transitions experience inverse ghosting. Plenty of transitions are above 25% overshoot, which is quite noticeable. The extreme mode is even worse. It does push the greater gray average up to 3.77 milliseconds, but overshoot becomes overwhelming, leading to huge bright halos around moving objects. So this mode is pretty much unusable. Unfortunately, when you look across these three modes, no mode is particularly good. In fact, I'd call both off and normal bad overdrive modes and extreme is terrible. So we're left with a bit of a predicament. Is it better to have 16 millisecond transitions with no overshoot or six millisecond transitions with substantial overshoot? Neither of these options are ideal, but yeah, this is what Acer is presenting here. When looking at pursuit camera footage using Blurbuster's UFO test, which simulates how the human eye sees motion on this display, you can see this predicament in action and how neither off nor normal deliver a great experience. Off is very slow with huge amounts of ghosting and smearing. Those trails behind the moving UFO are pretty poor. But then with normal, these ghost trails are replaced with inverse ghosting, which is a bright trail that in some circumstances is more noticeable than the blur trail. It's really hard to say which of these options is better because generally I wouldn't recommend either if there is an, another overdrive mode available, something between the two, but we aren't getting that here. Instead, we're left with a poor experience as the numbers earlier did suggest. I'd probably slightly prefer the normal mode with inverse ghosting. I think motion clarity is somewhat better, but we're choosing between two bad options here. And it's not like the monitor is more usable at 60 Hertz. In fact, performance is actually worse at 60 Hertz than it is at 75 Hertz with even greater levels of overshoot. It is a budget monitor, so I guess we can't expect too much, but motion handling is definitely not one of this monitor's strong points. How does the SB220Q compare to other 1080p monitors I've tested? Well, in terms of greater gray average using the normal overdrive mode, 6.40 milliseconds is not too bad for an IPS monitor. It's around the mark we're expecting, not as fast as TNs, not as slow as VAs. In fact, we get decent dark level performance beating some other cheap VA options like the Pixio PXC 243, for example. Response time compliance using this mode is also fine, as you'd hope with a 75 hertz refresh rate. But it's with error rates that everything falls apart for the SB220Q. An average error of 14.6% is the highest I've tested among 1080p monitors, most of which sit more in the 0 to 4% range using their optimal overdrive modes. And this gets even worse when looking at inverse ghosting. 46% of transitions suffering from the issue is way higher than most 1080p monitors, to the point where inverse ghosting is much more obvious than with any other monitor on this list. And let's run through some options here. The Viotech GN24C is a VA panel I've quite often recommended in the budget category, being 1080p 144Hz, and it puts up a 5 millisecond greater gray average with 5% inverse ghosting and similar dark level performance. That is significantly better motion handling than you get with the Acer SB220Q. And of course, we can see other options here too from companies like AOC, LG, and others. Of course, most of these other monitors are more expensive, around the $150 mark, so it makes sense that they would perform better, but I'm just not sure the SB220Q is delivering a great bang for buck experience with this sort of performance. The panel used here isn't great for gaming. 60Hz performance, again, it's okay in terms of response times, but does suffer from severe inverse ghosting. Input lag is typical of a budget monitor. We're seeing a processing delay around 3.5 milliseconds, a slow refresh rate, and modest response times. So this isn't delivering a low lag experience. Getting a 144Hz panel instead would go a long way to lowering input lag, but again, they are more expensive. Power consumption, as expected, is low at around 16 watts, although not that much lower than some 24-inch monitors I've tested. Still, if heat output or power consumption is a concern, the SB220Q is solid in this area. So at this point, we've established the SB220Q 
isn't very good as a gaming monitor. But how about as a general office type monitor or just something for web browsing? And this is where color performance is much more important. So let's dive right in. Out of the box calibration is decent, which is welcome used for buyers after a great color experience. My unit had near perfect white levels. And while this did fall off slightly when moving through the rest of the grayscale range with a minor yellow tint, it wasn't that noticeable and far exceeded my expectations from a dirt cheap monitor. A grayscale Delta E of 2.45 isn't perfectly accurate, but very good in this price category. Saturation performance is similar with a Delta E average of 2.48, mostly limited by some oddities with reds and greens. The panel used here can't quite hit 100% sRGB coverage, we're more at 93%, so there is a bit of clipping with greens, but overall performance is solid even though we end up with a 3.39 Delta E average in color checker. There isn't much that can be done to improve things using the OSD controls given the white point is already quite good, so the next step is a full calibration. As usual, this resolves most of our issues with this display's factory performance, tightening us up to a below 1.0 Delta E average across the board. It's not perfect, again we run into clipping issues with green and cyan, so I wouldn't recommend this display for color critical work, but for a sub $100 display this can deliver great color performance. If you're interested in using our ICC profile we created for this monitor, it's available for our Patreon members, links in the description below. Although as with all ICC profiles we create, we can't guarantee accuracy due to panel variants. Brightness from the SB220Q is mediocre at 240 nits after calibration, although not too far away from most budget monitors. This is still bright enough for most use cases, but if you have a really bright viewing environment like a sunny room, this might not be enough. Contrast ratio is also mediocre, not surprising given it's a cheap IPS panel, but still 882 to 1, puts it in the bottom rungs of our charts, and generally this is low for an IPS. If you want better black levels and contrast ratio, you'll have to fork out for a VA display. It's also worth pointing out that this is a native 6-bit panel that achieves 8-bit through FRC, so color banding with gradients is a little more noticeable here than with a true 6-bit display. With that said, viewing angles are excellent and the coding handles reflections well, so despite not having the most punchy blacks, the viewing experience here for colors I think is quite good. If you're doing some office work, watching a few YouTube videos or something like that, it's really hard to complain about what the SB220Q delivers. Uniformity is good as well, not the best I've seen, but the central area is well under control. There was a bit of a fall off in the top left and bottom right of my retail unit, and there was also a small amount of IPS glow noticeable in darker viewing environments environments, but nothing too terrible. So by now you should have a pretty good idea of how the SB220Q performs as a sub $100 monitor. I haven't reviewed a ton of monitors in this price category despite how popular they are, so let's go through some final thoughts and comparisons based on what I'd expect from an entry level product. Certainly this is not a perfect monitor, and to reach this sort of price point there are lots of compromises. Outside of panel performance, the small 21.5 inch size and lack of vase mounting immediately jump out at me as trade-offs, along with a fairly mediocre design all around. But these are common areas where I'd expect cost cutting and honestly, for a lot of use cases it's not going to be a big deal. In terms of actual panel performance, I think the SB220Q is perfectly fine for basic viewing, for office tasks, productivity, video playback, and that sort of thing. We're getting good factory calibration with a very solid white point, there's no obvious tint here, and that makes it great for document editing and web browsing, which is still dominated by expansive white areas. Combine that with excellent viewing angles and acceptable uniformity, and yeah, for a $90 monitor, I'm pretty impressed with the colors. The only big downside there is perhaps the contrast, but even that isn't too bad. On the other hand, the SB220Q is not good for gaming. I know it's not really advertised as a gaming monitor, but with a 75Hz refresh rate and adaptive sync, I'm guessing it's attracting a lot of gamers after something dirt cheap. Unfortunately, none of the overdrive modes are good, leaving us with either bad levels of smearing or bad levels of inverse ghosting, because at the end of the day, this is a cheap, low-end IPS panel with slow response times. It's probably not that different to other 60 to 75 hertz IPS monitors around the same price, but I'd class its motion handling as not very good. With today's low prices for 144Hz 1080p monitors, I don't think the SB220Q delivers a lot of bang for buck as a gaming display. The GN24C, 
PXC243 and AOC C24G1 are all around the $140 to $160 mark, so around 60% more expensive than the SB220Q. But at the same time, I'd say all of those monitors are at least twice as fast and twice as good at motion handling, not just from similar response times with no inverse ghosting issues, but also from their higher refresh rate at 144Hz versus 75Hz, which is a big improvement. Now we are talking here about $90 versus $150. For a lot of buyers, that's a big increase in price that's just not affordable, and that's understandable. For around $90, I can't see too many better options than the SB220Q. But I feel this situation is very similar to low-end graphics cards. The value isn't quite there with the absolute cheapest products, and you're better off moving up one tier where you get significant improvements. Those 144Hz monitors are such great value right now that my recommendation for entry-level gaming monitors is going to stay with them rather than this $90 option. But for just web browsing, YouTube, movies, maybe you want it as a second monitor, it's really not bad for $90. Maybe don't try import it to Australia, the shipping fees are very high. But if you're on Amazon and you want the best-selling monitor on there, yeah, it's okay. That's it for this review of the Acer SB220Q. Pretty interesting to see how one of the most popular monitors on Amazon performs. I hope you guys enjoyed watching this video and learned something about some of our sub $100 options that you can get right now. As always, you can subscribe for more monitor reviews from us here at Hardware Unbox. And if you're interested in supporting the channel and what we do here with some of our monitor testing, you can sign up to our Patreon page. Links are in the description below, or you can grab some of our merch like this hoodie that I'm wearing right now. Also, you'll find links to that in the description below. That's it for this one. I'll catch you in the next one.